Um, so thanks everyone for being here. My name is Virginia Smith. I'm an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University and I'm one of the four organizers of FLOW. So if you haven't been to FLOW before, um, FLOW stands for Federated Learning One World Seminar. So the goal of this uh, online seminar is basically to reach a, a wide audience and to cover a broad range of topics related to federated learning, including not only things like distributed optimization and privacy, but also topics like fairness and personalization and systems and hardware. Um, so we're very excited about the seminar and we're excited to have Philip Hansley with us today. Uh, so Philip is a PhD student at KAUST. He's working with Peter Richtarek. Uh, and his work covers various uh, problems in optimization for machine learning. And he will be joining TTIC as a research assistant professor starting this fall. Um, so that's great news. Uh, and today he'll be talking to us about some of his work um, looking at uh, a formulation of federated learning as a mixture of global and local models. Um, before I pass things over <laughs> to Philip, I wanted to mention two things about the, the seminar and the way that this works. So one is that um, this is being recorded. So the goal of that is to put this on the, the website afterwards. So just so you know, this is being recorded. Um, and the second thing is related to questions. So we'd love to make this interactive and for you to ask questions um, throughout the talk. Uh, so the way that this has worked previously is there are two ways to ask questions I see that some of you are already writing things in the chat window, which is great. So if you have a question, you can ask it in the chat window and either Philip will see that or if he doesn't see that, um, I can help to alert you, uh, Philip, but there's a question. Um, and the other way that you can ask questions is that uh, if you go to the participants list, you can see yourself and you can um, raise your hand. And if I see that there's a hand raised, I can help um, to, to stop and have you unmute yourself and ask a question verbally. Um, so that's another way to ask a question throughout. Um, so I think that's everything. Sam, was there anything I missed related to um, the format or how this works? No, I think you, you mentioned everything. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, perfect. So I think with that, we'll pass things over um, to Philip. And again, please, yeah, I, it would be great for you all to uh, make this interactive and ask questions yeah. along the way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off <laughs> so we can focus on the, um, the slides. Uh, but yeah, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you a lot, Virginia, for a great introduction. And I would like to also talk the rest of the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure for me to give a talk in front of this audience. And again, as Virginia mentioned, that feel free to ask questions either by writing it to the chat or by raising a hand and either I will notice or somebody else. And yeah, hopefully it's better not to get lost or confused at some point. So yeah, but let's ask questions. So in this talk, I'll talk about our recent paper or let's say two papers on federated learning of mixture of local and global models. And uh, yeah, again, th this is our two recent submission about our two recent submissions to, to NREPS. So the first one is my joint work with my advisor, Peter Richtarik, and second one is a joint work with, uh, with my two collaborators, Slavomir Hanzeli and Samuel Horvath. But I'll mostly talk about the first paper and I'll mention the second one at the beginning, at the end. Okay, so before starting about before starting, I'll first introduce what federated learning is and how or where our formulation stands. How does it motivate? So, and even before talking about federated learning, I'll firstly introduce what distribution optimization is. So distribution optimization, the, the goal of distributed optimization is to, we want to minimize some average of n functions where each of n functions is stored on given worker. So first worker owns the first function, second worker owns the second and so on. And those workers can communicate to, to, to can communicate with some central server. So worker does some local computation, send it to center, center server, and the, then the server sends it back. Here, this number n is number of workers and it's usually not too big. So that's really some number of, let's say powerful machines inside of some data center 
that are employed to solve a given problem. In classical distributed setup, I mean inside of the data center, we have a control about how to construct functions f1 and so on up to, up to fn. So it's us who distribute the data among those workers. And there is even a chance that those data are shared among the workers. So there is some central memory and each worker takes the data from memory and does something. Also, I mean, what, what is expensive here compared to standard centralized optimization is that the communication between worker and server is expensive. And consequently, one has to consider or control some kind of trade-off of local computation and communication. And again, the goal is just to find out Z star, which is the minimizer of, of our optimization problem, or which minimize this the finite sum. On the other hand, in federated learning, the objective is somehow similar. We again want to minimize some finite sum. However, the difference is that instead of workers, we have clients. So in distributed optimization, worker was some powerful machine, let's say. Here, client is usually mobile phone or something like that. And the number of clients is consequently something way, way larger, for example, that can be number of mobile phones in, in the world or in the network. So this is something big. Furthermore, those functions FIs are constructed only from the data of IT clients. So therefore we don't really have control over how functions F1 to Fn are constructed. And also, I mean, we don't really see what kind of data those functions have or those clients have. Those are ideally never revealed. So because we somehow, or the goal of federated learning is also somehow to protect the data of the clients. And unlike in standard distribution optimization where communication was somehow expensive, here it is even a bottleneck because those clients can be physically located on the different side parts of the, of the world. So usually the local computation is way cheaper comparing to communication in this case. And the goal of federated learning is to find some kind of model to be at the end deployed on each, each client. So the first issue of classical federated learning is personalization, which, I'm, which I'll explain now. So since functions FIs are constructed only from the data of IT client or, or each client, consequently, those data might differ really greatly. I mean, each, each mobile phone might have really different source of the data. Every user is, is different. And since the goal is to find a model to be at the end deployed on each client, this objective might be really wrong or might be, it might be questionable why do we really want to, to solve this minimization problem at the first place. And therefore there is some sort of need for personalization. Might, might, might be, maybe each client really wants something else than minimizer of the global population. Needs. And there was, I mean, for example, one paper from 2018, which where they showed that some personalized federated learning approach can significantly outperform the classical non-personalized -non one. And the application they used was the prediction of the next word when user types in a mobile keyboard. So consequently, some sort of personalization is often really required and can help a lot learning. The second issue of classical federated learning is essentially that the most typical or more the most widely used optimizer or the learning algorithm for federated learning problems, which is federated averaging or local local SGD, somehow doesn't or doesn't have as good convergence guarantees as one would hope, which I'm going to explain next. So. Before talking about local SGD, let's look at some even simple variant, which is local gradient descent. So what is local gradient descent doing? Is that for, firstly, it runs for, let's say, T minus one iteration locally gradient step. So each client owns now model XK, and you just run, let's say, T minus one iteration of, of gradient descent. And then after that, uh, we just average those those local models. So again, we run locally a few steps of gradient descent and then just average them. And now if functions or the local losses FIs are L smooth and mu strongly convex, 
then I mean, it it can be really shown that, for example, if the if this t, t is one, so if we every iteration firstly take gradient descent and then immediately average, the local gradient descent becomes exactly gradient descent, and consequently we have a linear convergence. On the other hand, however, if this t, which is number of local steps, is is more than one, the local gradient descent, as stated, has only a sublinear convergence. So therefore, is even slower than gradient descent. This thing can be somehow fixed using control variates by incorporating control variates to fix this non-stationarity. However, even in such a case, local gradient descent only has same communication as gradient descent, but t times more computation. So this theory doesn't really predict that we should use local gradient descent at all. And consequently, so, and furthermore, there are really no analysis of local gradient descent which shows any benefit over gradient descent. And that might really mean that the standard federated learning objective is not really something that local methods are, are doing. Furthermore, I mean, to, to be fair, there are some benefits of local methods once the data are identical. However, or, or when the workers or clients have all identical data or similar. However, such assumption is often questionable, especially for federated learning approaches, where those data can be really anything and local data might differ a lot. And the next thing, what I really want to mention that this doesn't really apply only to local gradient descent. It also applies to algorithms like local SGD, which is really the most popular federated lear learning algorithm. And there is really no analysis even for local SGD, which shows benefits over mini batch SGD for general heterogeneous data. And therefore, again, maybe those local methods are not really meant to solve the standard federated learning objective, but rather they solve something else. And our new formulation really tries to tackle both of those issues and personalization and explaining local gradient methods. So what we are trying to solve is the following objective, capital F of X, which is sum of F of X plus lambda psi of X. Now, first thing to know that in our case, the X, which is the variable over which we optimize, is not in d-dimensional space, but rather in n times d-dimensional space. So we leave the problem in n, n times d, and this x has n components, and each of them will be the model at the end deployed for each, each specific client. Now this f is just average, average loss. So it's like average of fi xi, so we just apply model xi to the to the local loss fi for each client and average those. So this is, I mean, the same thing really as before. However, there is some extra regularization parameter, which is lambda is more than zero, and penalty, quadratic penalty psi, where this psi is, what is it really doing? It's forcing those local models to be essentially similar. And what is that, that really doing compared to standard federating learning objective? we allow for different local models and penalize their dissimilarity. Classical federated learning objective rather forced the local models to be the same. And the second thing which is somehow nice is that on our objective, as we shall see, the local gradient descent will work here or the local methods will work well here. And consequently, we somehow, this objective answers both questions. So first one, or, or not really, it, it fixes the personalization, but also it asks the question like why, or answers the question why local methods really work. So before really continuing to, to about what exactly, what exactly we do and how, and stating our results, I will say what we are not doing in this talk. So first of all, we don't do any applications of deep learning or we, we don't argue about generalization error and such stuff. And the reason why is that local methods are already well studied in practice. And consequently, we, and they already work well for, for deep learning. So our formulation really somehow, we will, the, the point of our formulation is rather to, to show that 
local methods are really solving something else. So therefore these deep learning applications or generalization are really well studied in other works. And also what we do next is we do some enhancements as control variance and acceleration, which really show that, I mean, thanks to them, we can prove a better convergence rate of our methods. However, those things are not really meant to be for deep learning. I mean, control variates, the application of control variates or variance reduction for deep learning is often questionable. And also the application of classical nesteros acceleration for deep learning is often sometimes questionable. There are other things which sometimes work better. So therefore we don't really do that. And we also don't aim in this work to solve the standard federated learning formulation. So one can argue that if you add this quadratic penalty or if, if we add high enough quadratic penalty, the solutions will be somehow close to each other. And maybe one can solve classical federated learning formulations using ours. We don't do that. So before continuing further, are there some questions? Is it something which was unclear so far? Feel free to either write to the chat or raise on your hand and somebody will unmute you. I think there's a raised hand. So let me just go ahead and unmute if I can, or that person can <laughs> unmute themselves. Hold on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the lambda's uh, parameter is a fixed or constant? Yeah, it's a fixed constant. So if I decay lambda to zero, does that recover the original form of federated learning? Okay, so if you set lambda to infinity, actually, in such a case, we recover standard federated learning. Oh, okay. I, I will show that in a moment, but yeah, okay. but it's a, it's a fixed constant. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I see that somebody wrote in the chat that there is ADMM approach very close to your formulation. Can you explain the relation between them? This approach is very common in distributed learning. So first of all, uh, I'm not sure. So, so, so far this is just formulation. ADMM is, is an algorithm. So I guess, can you, can you maybe un unmute yourself and formulate the question better because it's true that the similar formulation is somehow common in distributed learning and and so on. And this formulation itself is not really new. However, what is our formulation, what is our contribution of this work is that we, thanks to this formulation, are able to explain local methods better. And what's the difference? What's the, another question is what is the difference from the formulation in the FedProx work in MLSYS 2020. So I'm not sure what kind of paper was that. Maybe what we will do now is I'll continue further in, in slides and maybe the, the answer to those questions will be, will be answered on the, on the way in the slides next. Another question was if I can comment on the relationship between this approach and elastic averaging SGD. So again, so far I didn't talk about any algorithm to solve this formulation. I will talk about it in a moment. And probably this can be compared to this elastic averaging SGD. Okay, so let us, let, let us then continue. So, and explain this formulation further. So, Again, what we do, we minimize sum of two terms. First is f of x plus lambda psi, where f of x is the essentially the, the average of f i x size and this lambda psi is quadratic penalty. So let us now look how solution of this problem looks as a function of lambda. So x lambda will be the optimal solution of this objective as a function of lambda. So first of all, if lambda is equal to zero, what we are really doing, we are just minimizing average, average of fi xi without any penalty. And what it really means is that oh, xi zero or the optimal solution in such a case is just minimizer of the local, local objective. Consequently, there is no communication required for such problem because every client can just solve its own problem. On the other hand, in the purely global scenario, when lambda is equal to infinity, what we do, we minimize average of fi's 
applied to one specific model Z. And consequently, the optimizer in such a case is just minimizer of the classical federated learning, class, classical federated learning objective. And consequently, all of them are really the same. I mean, the so solution deployed on each client, client is the same. Next, I'll really talk about how this parameter lambda is influencing the solution. So if we plot now x lambda minus x zero, and the distance between x lambda and x zero, and distance between x lambda to x, in, x infinity. So this blue line is, is how does distance of the optimum as a function of lambda it evolves as we vary lambda, and orange thing is as the as ha, is how the distance evolve as we vary varied lambda again, but the distance to the purely global solution. So we can see that if lambda is zero again, or if lambda is somehow small, the solution is close to the the minimizers of the local functions or the exact minimizers of the local functions. On the other hand, if lambda is something relatively large, the solution is close to the, the purely global, purely global solution or solution of classical federated learning. Next, somehow, the, this, the, the solution, what we argue next is the solution of our problem is somehow similar to MAML, which is meta-agnostic, sorry, meta-agnostic, Ah, okay, which is meta model agnostic meta learning, sorry. So optimality conditions for our problem, what they say, if, if we just apply optimality conditions, first order optimality conditions, what they say is that the local solution for given lambda is equal to average minus gradient. So what it really says is that the local solutions are just gradient away from their average. On the other hand, for MAML, which is, I mean, well-known algorithm for meta-learning, if we apply just station, if you look at what is stationary point of this MAML, what we can say is, again, that the local solution are just gradient away from some point. However, this point is not really the average of the personalized models. It's rather rather something else. But I mean, it's, it's, those are still gradients away from, from one point. To be honest, also, they are gradient, those gradients are evaluating a slightly different point, but the structure of those two things is, is very similar. Okay. So that was so far for, just for the formulation, and now we will talk about, we will talk about the, the algorithms. So are there some questions so far about the formulation itself? And soon I will talk about how does this really relate to relate to local methods. And again, as mentioned, yes, the formulation itself is not new. That was already used in distributed learning. Even more general objectives were used for distributed learning. However, what we do here is we connect that to local methods and argue that even later on, those local methods will be optimal to solve our formulation. So if there are some questions about that, feel free to ask. Either somebody will unmute you or write it to the comments. I think there was a previous question. I'll just, I'll just answer since I'm here. I think about FedProx mm -hmm. and um, Philip, maybe you can correct me if this is wrong, but there was a question about how this relates to FedProx. Um, in FedProx, the goal is to solve the original federated learning formulation, um, but to solve at every, uh, on every device or every client a different local subproblem so that the solution that's um, found at each of those local uh, subproblems is slightly more well behaved. Basically, what FedProx is doing is preventing you from going too far from the initial iterate. Um, that's very different, I think, than what is um, what Philip is talking about here, where you're solving a, a different um, formulation of the actual federated learning objective. Um, oh. so, correct me if I'm wrong with that, Philip. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I think Virginia is Virginia is right, and now I mean I, I didn't know that that's the paper that was meant because okay, anyway, yeah, FedProx is the algorithm to solve the original FL formulation, and we will also show 
in, in fact that we, we showed that some variants of fat procs are really optimal even to solve our, our algorithm. That's what we will talk about at the end. Cool, but yeah, but yeah, FedFrox solves the original FL formulation, which we recover as a special case, but the connection will be made at the end. Okay, so let me continue and say how really this formulation connects to the local methods. So first of all, what we do is minimize f of x, this sum of f of x and lambda psi. What I will do now is rewrite the problem in some really weird way, which, which is that I will just write the same objective, but copy function f of x t times. So again, what I did, it, this is, I mean, just equality. I just wrote the original, original objective as finite sum of t plus one terms, where t of them is really just function f of x copied. So t of them is just function of f of x, and one of them is function of lambda psi. And now what we will do is we will apply cyclic version of gradient descent on this specific objective. So what this is doing is that this cyclic gradient descent is that we t, we t times apply gradient step with respect to function f, and then we, we apply a single step with, with single gradient step with respect to function psi. So now the gradient step with respect to function f, what is it doing? Is, is it that we update the local, we just take gradient steps on each local model and single gradient step with respect to psi, what is it doing? It's just, it's just we do convex combination between local model and average of the local models. So this is rather a step towards the average. What is however interesting is that if we tune a step size, step size of this cyclic gradient descent method, we can recover local gradient descent exactly as a special case. Because this gradient step with respect to F is exactly local gradient step and single step, the step with this gradient step with respect to Psi is step towards the average. So once the step size is tuned, it can be really the exact average. So we really can recover local gradient descent as special case of this cyclic gradient descent applied on this formulation. Okay, alpha, it's not mentioned here, but alpha would be the step size of this cyclic gradient descent. So consequently, this beta and, and gamma would be are really functions of, the, of that step size. Okay, so next, what, what, what we do or what we analyze in this work our first algorithm will be some modification of local gradient descent, where instead of fixed number of local steps, we'll have a random number of local steps. So that would be really something like SGD applied on, on the previous, previous formulation instead of, instead of the cyclic gradient descent. So what this should do is really, it should make the analysis simpler, simpler and better rate, and also produce somehow better rate comparing to the cycling method. To be perfectly fair, a few days ago, th there appeared a paper on archive showing that essentially cyclic version of gradient descent would really outperform the, the stochastic one, unlike in the standard theory, but I mean, we didn't really know that at the time where we, when we developed this and also I mean, for vari va variants of cyclic gradient descent with some sort of reshuffling stuff like acceleration of variance reduction wasn't really done yet. So anyway, the next modification of this local method would be that we add some kind of control variance or variance reduction to give the correct fixed point to the algorithm. And the third modification will be, we also allow for some sort of subsampling the local objective if the local objective has, is of finite some structure itself. So those are the three methods that I will now, now describe quickly. So let, let us firstly talk about this loopless version of local gradient descent or L2GD. What we will do, we will now apply non-uniform version of SGD on this two sum objective, f of x plus lambda psi. So consequently, the algorithm will be something like that, that xk plus one is equal to xk minus alpha gk, where gk is either computed as as gradient of f xk 
divided by one over P and that's with probability one over P or it will be lambda times gradient of psi divided by P with probability P. So what that, does that mean with probability one minus P we take a local gradient step with some step size and with probability one and with probability P we take a step towards the average. And such a method, what is also nice about that, that now this gradient estimator GK is, is unbiased. So on average, we go to the correct direction, which is gradient of F, but yeah, we do with some probability gradient step with respect to F and with some probability gradient step with respect to Psi. What is also somehow interesting that on average, such a method does one minus P over P local steps in between of aggregations. And this number of local steps in between of two aggregations or in between of evaluations of gradient of, of Psi follows a geometric distribution. And also on average per K iterations of this method, what we need is just P times one minus PK communications. And this is because we really need to communicate only when we are switching between gradients of F and gradients of Psi. So when two different coin tosses land, then we really need to communicate. And the third somehow important point is that the taking gradient step with respect to Psi never leads to the full averaging in this case, because our theory allows only the step size gamma to be less than one half. But yeah, this is rather just essentially a detail. So consequently, there are two differences of this L2GD to standard gradient descent. First one is that we do only a step towards the averaging. And second one is that we do a random number of local steps. So now the main theorem of our work, or, or not our work, the convergence rate of this L2GD is something like that. So if the step size alpha of the method is less than something, then we, we have the following inequality. Now, less than something, it should be less than one over two L, where this L is something like one over L, one over N max L over one minus P lambda over P, where functions F, Fi's are L smooth. So what this really is, is essentially some kind of expected smoothness or smoothness smoothness in expectation. So that really takes care of both smoothness and randomness. So alpha should be less than some function of smoothness and randomness. Next, this mu is strongly convex, is strong convexity of local objectives. And this sigma is something is, what it really is, is essentially some kind of variance of the gradient estimator at the optimum. So what it depends, it depends on gradients of Fi's at the optimum and distances of x i s to the to the optimal solution and this this theorem is nothing but just application of some well known s g d convergence rate to to our setup so what what this really says is that we get linear convergence up to some neighborhood, and this linear convergence is determined just by step size and strong convexity. Okay, now it's somehow not nice to have only linear convergence to a neighborhood for, for our algorithm, just because if we apply just plain gradient descent, we wouldn't have, we would have linear convergence to the exact optimum and consequently faster rate. So what we do next is we apply control variates on top of this, this version of SGD. So if we apply control variates, what we do, we just effectively get rid of this extra additive term and we get a linear convergence to the exact optimum. And this application of control variates is something similar to what was done in a scaffold paper that Pranit Karimidi already was talking about, if I remember correctly, last week here at Flow Seminar. But however, the difference is that Again, scaffold is meant to solve the original federated learning formulation, whereas we, we don't, we do this penalized one. But again, the, this type of control variance that we applied is similar to what was done over there. 
And I have a question, sorry, about um, this, uh, this term x0 minus x lambda, how that changes with lambda? How that changes with lambda? So, so x lambda is just optimal solution for given lambda. So we, we can really, I mean, probably it would be better to, to write here that it's not x lambda, it's x star. It's just optimal solution. We want to really solve the problem for given lambda. So this x lambda is rather constant. And how does that changes with lambda? I mean, we were talking about that a few slides back, like how does the solution look as we change lambda? So if lambda is zero, this x lambda would be just optimal solution of, or minimizer of each local loss or, or, or loss of a given client. On the other hand, if x lambda is the infinity, in such a case, this is, I mean, the, the global solution of the, I mean, total population average. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but, but I guess the answer is that x lambda here is really a constant because we want to solve the problem for given lambda. Okay, the convergence rate of, uh, and what this really says, I mean, if we really plug their things and so on, is that if we choose probability P of order la lambda divided by L plus lambda, in such a case, the communication complexity of this method becomes minimum of L lambda divided by mu log one over epsilon. Now, what is however, Interesting is that this probability P is somehow optimal, both in terms of communication and local com computation, as we shall see soon. And, but why this rate is good? Why communication of order minimum L lambda over mu log one over epsilon is good? First of all, if lambda is zero, so we are in the set in this purely local setup that each client solves just its own problem, we get exactly zero communication, which is, and also somehow optimal number of local steps we should take because the number of local steps depends on the probability or how, how often we aggregate. And I mean, few slides back, we said that the number of local steps in between of aggregation is something like one minus P over P. That's the average number of local steps in between of two aggregations. So consequently, if P, if lambda is zero, the number of local steps in such a case will be infinity. So it really says there, there is no aggregation. On the other hand, if lambda is of order L, then what, what this shows that what we should do is a constant number of local steps. And the smaller lambda goes, the more local steps we should be doing. So this is rather some kind of explanation on, on how, how the number of local steps behave as we as we change lambda or the, op the, the optimal number of local steps for this method behave as we change lambda. Okay, and the third thing, what we do is we, so, so, so far those methods were all deterministic in the following sense that we assume that the local objective is just a function, we can access its gradients. So now if local objective is a finite sum on its own and it's finite sum of m elements, then if we again apply something like before. So for each Xi, something like before, but also subsample this finite sum. So now this GIK, which is gradient estimator of height compo for each client, that thing will be with probability one minus P, we sample random J and the gradient will be just one over N gradient FIJ at, at current lo local model divided by one over P. And with probability P, what that would be, it would be just the component of, it would be just a step towards the average as, as before. And now if probability, again, if probability is something like that, that four, four lambda plus mu divided by four lambda plus four L plus N plus one mu, which is something similar than before, what we get is communication of order this L minimum of L plus M mu lambda divided by mu log one over epsilon. And again, if lambda is equal to zero, where that in such a case, the communication is zero as well for, for this type of method. 
And again, this sort of convergence rate is nothing but, I mean, application of some well-known theory for variance reduced methods. And what is also somehow nice about that, that this really shows somehow that more, more, more local steps, if lambda is small, more local steps it really leads to benefits in terms of the convergence rate, unlike for standard federated learning formulation. Okay, are there some questions about this part of the talk? Philip, maybe you can comment on the connection to the ADMM. The, the previous comment, if you wish to. Okay, so to be honest, I I would really need to. I would really need need, need to, to see that paper. But as far as I see, the ADMM is just a different algorithm to solve probably this type of formulation. That's what I'm get. I, I'm guessing I haven't seen that paper. But as far as I see, I guess that would be the thing. That ADMM would be a different algorithm to solve this type of formulation. So, so I will have a comment on this if I may uh, to mm -hmm. answer that question. So uh, ADMM uh, is a method for solving the original problem. So not, not, not the one where these XIs are allowed to be different. And there is a trick, there's a reformulation when one says that these XIs are allowed to be different, but then there is a hard constraint, which, which says that uh, these XIs are supposed to be uh, the same. So, so one lifts this to higher dimension and then introduces a constraint and then there's a particular algorithm which, which solves this. But what okay. we do is something that looks similar, but we're actually not trying to solve the original formulation. So we really uh, propose here uh, what Philip was uh, um, describing uh, a formulation where these XIs are allowed to be different and that's what we want to solve. So, so this is really not closely related to the MN. Okay, thanks a lot for clarification. Okay, there is another question. How L smoothness is different in L2GD and L2SGD plus? So in L2GD, we assumed that uh, the local objective FI is L smooth. What he, we here assume that the, the, the summand of, of local, what we assume here is that each F, FIJ with tilde is tilde L smooth. So those things can be really different, but I mean, one can sh show some kind of inequality between those two terms. And specifically one can always show that L without tilde is smaller than L with tilde. And also that this L without tilde is bigger than L with tilde divided by M. So one can show something like that. And the what would be the real, I mean, the, the real ratio is somehow, it can be anything between one and one over M. So they can be similar, but they can be also vastly different. So that's why we differentiate between those two things. I think there's also a raised hand if that person wants to ask their question. Yeah, uh, so sorry, Philip, you probably mentioned in the beginning of the talk, but could you like comment on some benefit of considering this model versus uh, uh, the classic of the original spread of learning? So, so what is so, the benefit so, of introducing Lambda <laughs> and... Okay, so, so one benefit can be the following. So, so far, local methods, so, so the, the benefit would be in terms of explaining the local methods. So first of all, the local methods are currently probably the most used algorithms to, to apply on federated, federated learning problems. However, the current theory don't really show that especially, or doesn't show that for those methods should be good for federated learning applications. It doesn't show that. What, however, our formulation what we show that essentially those local methods, something really similar to local SGD or local gradient descent is essentially in fact solving our formulation. And therefore, I mean, maybe what local methods are doing are not really designed to solve the original federated learning formulation, but they are designed to solve our formulation. 
to be fair, I mean, the classic, I mean, the classical theory for federated learning methods, there one should use some, something like really small step size four in terms of the, I mean, for the local steps, for local gradient steps. On the other hand, in practice, people use something larger. On, and if you use larger step, then the classical theory for the local gradient methods wouldn't really apply or you would get far away from the, the, the true optimum. And in that, in that sense, uh, what we somehow show is that if you do this larger step size locally, you are essentially solving our formulation. That's roughly the idea. And also there is another question if I should, if I can explain in what sense P is optimal. So P is optimal in the following sense. We proved some kind of convergence guarantee for, for any probability P. And what we do here is we then optimize this sort of convergence guarantee in terms of P. And so, so P is the, the aggregation probability which in which directly influences number of local steps. So this is aggregation probability, which leads to the best communication complexity of our algorithm. And also it turns out that's the best one for, for the local, for the number of local steps. But we are, what we care about mostly is the communication. Uh, I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any connection between your solution and augmented Lagrange multipliers? Well, so probably that, that was the answer or the question that P Peter was, P Peter already commented on, that the, yeah. the method yeah, the, or, or that yeah, ADMM yeah. is essentially an algorithm to solve the original for the federated learning formulation, which is, which is when lambda is infinity. And yes, I mean, it allows the local model models to differ and so on, but at the end, you really want them to be the same. And this is just something for how to make the, the convergence slightly faster. What we do on the other hand is something else. And we, we really explicitly want Lambda to be smaller. And in fact, the most interesting scenario is when Lambda is small, in which case the number of local steps of local gradient methods would be large. Okay, thanks. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I will quickly go to the experiments. So in, in first experiment, we want to demonstrate this. There is still one more. Okay, there is one more. One more. For heterogeneous dat data, is P the same for all agents? Okay, that's also a good question. So, I mean, the current theory which we developed is that uh, all else should be the same, essentially. Oh, 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 okay, so, so the current, the, the cu current version of the, okay, sorry, the current theory we, we developed is su such that uh, all those smoothness constants for each client and so on are the same. Th that's what is written here. I think in paper, what we have, we also allow for different else and so on. And in such a case, if some local function is, has smaller smoothness constant, it might make sense to have somehow the, or oh, the probability smaller for that. But I mean, the, the current theory, what is presented here, we don't do any sort of partial participation or stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, in paper, we, we discussed that. So, and for, first of all, the, the data can be perfectly heterogeneous and still one can have the smoothness constant the same for every single function. So I wouldn't say it really depends on heterogeneity, but I mean, in the real world, one might want to have piece different just because one client might not have access to the internet or might have less access to the internet than others and that guy would communicate less. Okay, so let me quickly describe the experiments. So as mentioned, this loopless version of, of local SGD, in this loopless version of local SGD, on average, we do one minus P over P local steps between aggregations. And on average per K iterations, we do 
p times one minus p k communication rounds. So in this plot, what we show is that we we have one specific problem and we run loopless version of SGD or, or this loopless version of local SGD with variance reduction for some number of iterate, iterations to get epsilon solution. And what we plot for every value of this aggregation probability, we, we show how many communications are required to get to the epsilon solution. And we can see that the line looks something like that. And what it really somehow means that if the number of local steps is big, which means that the aggregation probability is small, then we have a good communication and we have somehow bad communication if the number of local steps is somehow small in between of in be, in, be, in between of the communication rounds. And also, I mean, once the the commun once we communicate. Uh, less frequently than some threshold, the communication complexity doesn't really change much. So, and this, this is something also in perfect accord with our theory and also with intuition of local methods in general. And here we do another sort of experiments when we compare uh, three different algorithms. So first one will be just, uh, L2 SGD, so it will be loopless local version of SGD where we don't use any control variates. Then the second one would be loopless local SGD2 where we use only control variates to, to, to fix this non-stationarity of, of local methods. So we use only control variants for lambda f, but not for finite sum within local subproblems. And the third one is L2 SGD plus where we use we use control variates for everything. And we compare that on two different objectives. So in first one, we we use heterogeneous data and another one we use somehow homogeneous data. But again, those data are not in this case identical. They are just homogeneous. So we split the data randomly. And in the first three cases, we split the data such that we firstly sort the label to better mimic the local methods. And what we somehow see that how, first of all, how we split the data doesn't really influences the convergence. So therefore our methods are really suitable for truly, hot, truly heterogeneous data. And second thing is really that as expected, the method with full variance reduction converges linearly to the exact solution. And the method without control variates converges to the to the neighborhood which is somehow large and method with control variates only only for for this non-stationarity of local methods converges also to some neighborhood which is somehow smaller than the neighborhood of method without control variates so are there some questions about the experiments if not then i will or okay let me just now go very quickly through what we are doing in the in the second paper. So what we propose in the second paper is we propose some kind of lower bounds on both communication and local gradient complexity of our, or, or on communication and local computation for our federated learning formulation. And then we argue about what are the, what are the optimal algorithms and somehow Essentially, we, we showed that often accelerated variance reduced versions of local SGD are optimal. And also some sort of variance of accelerated fed prox is optimal. And yeah, some of those algorithms were in fact proposed in the this paper, which is mentioned here on some different, on some more general objective than what, what, what we have. But yeah, this is roughly it. And really, I mean, the locality, or local methods are, or either local SGD or, or some variants of FedProx are really method of the choice if lambda is small. So this is really the scenario where local methods shine. And that's what roughly should be the takeaway that that's where local methods are good. So if I want to summarize what we did, we propose a new federated learning formulations where variants of local SGD are beneficial on heterogeneous data. 
we show that we show and then we show some lo lower complexity bounds and discuss optimal algorithms and really the local locality is good for smaller alpha which is in contrast to standard application where lambda is infinity or in such case we recover the standard celerity learning so the idea is that maybe local methods are not good for the standard formulation, but rather shining quite different scenario. So if there are some questions, I think I ran out of time exactly. So if there is some quick question, I can, I can answer that. I have a quick question maybe while um, others are formulating questions. I know there were a lot of questions throughout, which is great. Um, I was wondering, can you, in, in the theory, do you handle partial participation or is that something that you looked at for the method I mean, as well? We had handled some kind of essentially, I mean, it, it's, we, we handled, okay, so in, in, in this fir first paper, we handled some sort of partial participation, but I mean, that's not the, the main point. And also this partial participation is essentially not completely, I mean, it's not completely, I mean, it, it's not the most honest version of partial participation. What we do is rather that every single iteration, some workers can sw switch on and switch on, just because in such case, we could apply some theorem from some other paper. But anyway, I mean, I believe those things can be perfectly extended to okay. partial participation as well. Okay, got it. So it, it um... Is it a special case of, I guess, like they're just being zero local steps for one of the devices or something? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, partial partic I mean, standard local algorithms can be implemented with partial participation. So in such case, yeah, I mean, it would be that for, I mean, okay, in such case, the algorithm wouldn't really be SGD, it would be some sort of SGD with non-stationary distribution. Because if we want that in between of two computational rounds, some worker doesn't really work. What we have is, is essentially stationary version of SGD with partial participation. That every iteration worker flips a coin and either do local computation or not. That's roughly what we have. Okay, got it. Okay. Let's see if anyone else has other questions, feel free to put them in the chat window or, or raise a hand as before. All right, well, I think if um, that's everything we can think, Philip. <laughs> Thanks, Philip, for um, the talk today. And we'll be posting this on the uh, Flow website. So um, you can look at the recording there if you want to follow up with anything. Um, yeah, but thanks. Okay, thank you as well for, for, for having me here. So. <laughs>